Okay, so we are live now, and we are um, joined today by a few members of the House Health Care Committee, and also by Nolan Langweil of Joint Fiscal, who has uh, worked on um, many of these issues around EMS funding. So thank you, Nolan. You can you can feel free to turn your video off if you feel like it, but we would we may call on you. Um, so this is the uh, House Government Operations Committee. We are um, we are going to do some work today uh, that goes along hand in hand with S-182 that we passed out of committee last week. Um, and this is to dig into some of the background around um, funding of training for EMS uh, providers. And uh, we had had a flurry of emails in conjunction with the uh, S-182 when it came over, um, just explaining how tenuous the financial situation is for EMS services during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And so I thought it would be helpful for us to understand the context of what the healthcare committee has done. And then I can fill you in a little bit on how the Senate Government Operations Committee has proceeded and, uh, and we can have a bit more of a committee discussion about how to, how to move forward. Um, so uh, before we get started, Andrea, I'm going to ask you if you can try to email uh, Rob and see if he's having trouble getting in. Um, his uh, his identity still says he's joining, so I'm not sure whether he's got a got a challenge or maybe he's just um, stepped away from his computer before pushing go. All right. So welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, I think that what would be helpful um, just for context setting would be to have Mari and or David from healthcare, House Healthcare, um, describe to us what was contained in the bill that you passed out of committee um, and then a little bit more on where that bill currently is. So I don't know if you two have already talked about who has the, Mari, you reported the bill, is that correct? That's correct. This is uh, Representative from Lincoln and House Healthcare Committee. Um, we worked on, House Healthcare worked on H742, which was um, the original sponsor of the bill was Representative Harrison. And um, the problem that H-742 in all of its forms until the major amendment, which I'll get to in a minute, um, was to address the critical workforce shortage um, in Vermont's EMS uh, system, particularly at the local volunteer level. Um, and now when we need them most, uh, there is a trending decrease in the number of EMS uh, providers in Vermont. Um, and just for an example, in 2019, um, EMS responders in Vermont answered more than 97,000 calls. This is pre-COVID. Um, and 79% of those services reported not having adequate staff. Um, and from the testimony that we heard, uh, the main obstacles to maintaining or growing the workforce were cost of training and the actual um, process to obtain uh, funding to do the training um, was burdensome. There was a lack, there, a lack of leader, consistent leadership personnel in the existing state training coordinator. It's an position. And then the appropriation of funding um, to these EMS providers has not always been needs-based, which has led to inequity in where the funds have been distributed around the state. So um, just as a review, I think you've probably already heard this and um, Department of Health and um, uh, Mr. Hazleton from MSAC will um, likely get into this in more detail, but the current funding for um, training for EMS providers comes from um, assessments on various forms of insurance that comprises revenue to the fire safety fund of the Department of Health. Um, and from that fund um, already established is $150,000 per year that is designated for the e emergency medical 
services fund to support training and other activities related to the delivery of emergency medical services. Um, when we took last took when we passed H seven forty two out of house health care at that time, the fund um, the AMS fund um, had. $375,000 in already appropriated undistributed training funds. So um, the original form of seven, H742 um, from Representative Harrison was much more comprehensive, um, involved more money and more appropriations. Um, and I'm uh, not recalling the specific history um, of how we ended up with the bill that we passed out of committee, um, but it was, it's much shorter, it was much um, simpler, and um, the amount of money that um, we were, um, it was already appropriated, so I'm not sure the word, but um, asking that it be used uh, because it was already there, we were directing the Department of Health to actually disperse the money um, was $300,000. And then prospectively, um, for the next fiscal year, there would be another $150,000 um, deposited into that account um, as it had been in previous years. So. Um, That's what um, the main part of uh, the, the amended by our committee H-742 did was um, direct that $450,000 be um, distributed through Department of Health um, in consultation with, and this is something else that we added after we heard testimony um, from MSAC, the Emergency uh, Medical Services Advisory Council, which was established in statute. Um, we heard that um, uh, there was a need for MSAC to be more routinely and directly involved in how training funds were distributed um, and in other activities related to emergency medical services. So our uh, H-742, um, added language to make sure that MSAC um, what would be directly involved and recognized by the state as um, the entity that would um, help with this, this process. Um, we heard from the sponsor, Representative Harrison, um, and then the chair of MSAC, the Emergency Medical Services Advisory Committee, Drew Hazelton, from the as executive director of the ANA, um, the lobbyist for the American Property Casualty Insurance Association, from senior fiscal analyst from JFO, public health policy advisor from Department of Health, um, EMS chief from Department of Health, and deputy, deputy chief counsel, um, ledge counsel. Now, um, Representative Durfee and Harrison, I don't know if you want to add anything more. David, go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you, and, and maybe get on the screen, actually. <laughs> uh, this is Representative Durfee. Uh, I don't have much to add to, uh, to Mari's testimony, and uh, I, no, I think she covered it all. Jim, Jim might have a different perspective since he uh, was part of the original the original bill. But uh, and I think also having uh, Drew Hazelton here and Shayla Livingston will be very helpful. Great. I would just like to add that um, since uh, we all left um, to have these meetings at home, um, I have reached out to the. Uh, Secretary of Agency of Human Services and the Assistant Secretary um, to ask about where the where we were at with funding um, EMS services. And I've also and um, I haven't I've heard a little bit, but I haven't um, gotten a complete answer to my questions. I've also been hearing from EMS providers that are constituents um, as you know early on in the COVID. Um, 
situation. Um, and it, what they were saying was not good. They were not getting the help that they needed. And I won't go into those details um, because we have other folks that can testify to that. Oh, and lastly, this bill H-742, Pat, we passed in the house um, on March 13th, Friday the 13th. And as soon as it was passed, uh, we went through all remaining stages of passage, turned it into a uh, um, amendment, our committee amended it and it turned S or H-742, um, it was a strike all amendment. So um, none of the language that I just talked about actually moved forward because we used H-742 as the vehicle for um, the uh, COVID response, uh, mostly around um, healthcare and DFR um, and uh, licensing. And at the time, I assume your committee wasn't considering the original language to be strictly COVID response. And so that's why it didn't make it into the March 13th final bill? Yeah, we felt that um, the COVID responses that we had been working on that with stakeholders and lobbyists um, and other legislators was of critical importance. And we, we just wanted to get the COVID um, bill out um, and across to the Senate. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Jim Harrison. Yeah, thank you. And thanks, Mari, for um, that summary. I think you you got it pretty much uh, everything that happened. I uh, A number of you on the committee also uh, signed on as co-sponsored. I think there was a lot of interest in the whole issue of providing uh, some help with training, um, especially when it came to our volunteer first responders who in many cases are expected to uh, come up with six, seven, eight hundred dollars uh, for the privilege of volunteering in their communities and and wanting to help. So um, I, I do have to tell you, as I think back to whatever whatever date it was, March 13th, and I sat there on the House floor and 742 kept getting passed over and over and over. I didn't know exactly what was going on. I didn't think the bill was controversial. Um, but then I noticed that the healthcare committee sort of was disappeared from the house floor. Um, the house actually kept the original provision uh, as passed by committee in the bill. The Senate ended up taking it out just to make it, uh, I think clean and COVID related and, and timely, um, but be that as it may. Um, I think there was some pushback on the original bill uh, because it, it provided a little bit more money for training, 750000 and that money uh, came from a surcharge or an increase in the surcharge that's currently assessed against uh, uh, insurance companies for, you know, auto, homeowners, uh, property casualty. Um, and I, I suspect some of the insurance carriers or their um, representatives you know, didn't want to see any kind of increase. So I think that pushed it back and, and to come to appropriations with new money um, is always a challenge. So, um, you know, I, I commend the committee for what they did. It's just in fortunate circumstances, we weren't able to get that piece done. So, thank you. Thanks for that context, Jim. I appreciate it. Um, so I think next what, what would be helpful is if we heard from Drew Hazelton, um, who can help us uh, understand a little bit more about the challenges that EMS services have from around the state. So Drew, go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you and uh, thank you for uh, inviting me. I know uh, some of the people that are on the call, but uh, just a quick introduction. Um, Drew Hazelton, I'm Chief of Operations at Rescue Inc. down in Brattleboro. Uh, a, uh, the Vice President and Legislative Chair of the Vermont Ambulance Association, and I do chair uh, the EMS Advisory Committee. Um, I've been working in EMS in Vermont as a volunteer and career uh, for about 25 years. So I did send uh, a couple slides ahead. I don't know if we can put those up or if I should put those up. I don't know how that works during these type of meetings. 
Um, so they are on the committee's page, uh, Andrea tells me. And so um, I guess committee, I'm uh, wondering if you would prefer to have a screen share on um, on screen right now, in which case one of us can fire it up or, um, or conversely, if you have a second. Um, Okay, so Andrea's got Andrea's got the document up. Andrea, let's go ahead and have you do a screen share while Drew is talking. And Drew, if you need her to to scroll through it at all, or if it's multiple pages, you can let Andrea know um, she's listening, but her computer audio is not working right now, so okay. she should be able to respond to you. But uh, but she may not verbally respond. Great. So um, I tried to put together a, a simple kind of state of uh, the EMS system in Vermont using uh, a lot of the information that we've already presented uh, through the EMS Advisory Committee over uh, the last few months. So as we heard a little while ago, um, EMS in Vermont runs almost 100,000 calls a year, um, and that's done with about uh, 2,800 EMS providers. Um, working through 82 ambulance services and 92 uh, first response squads. So I think it's really important to recognize that EMS in Vermont is very different than EMS in uh, a lot of uh, the rest of the country. Most uh, ambulance services in Vermont are not municipal. The majority of these services are uh, actually nonprofit, uh, either serving one or multiple communities. And um, again, 93% of uh, transporting agencies and 97% of our, our first response squads are actually volunteers. I really think that's important because we're asking a lot of these volunteers and a lot of their time um, already in the sense that uh, we, we expect them to, to go out late at night um, and go out uh, and keep up with their training and education. Um, and currently we're also asking them to uh, go ahead and fund their own EMS education. Um, slides go down. Yeah, hang on just a second because okay. Andrea is having a little technical difficulty. Okay. Her internet is acting up. Let me see if I can have that. All right, there we go. Uh, so we just scroll down um, <laughs> to the next page, I think. Andrea, how's your how's your internet working now? Are you able to scroll through the document? My apologies. We'll uh, hopefully we'll get this back on track in a moment. There we go. Now you're scrolling. Can you uh, scroll to the second page, Andrea? Uh, so Andrea, we can see only the header of page two. So if you're able to, um, if you're able to scroll a little further, great. If not, we can kick it over to Betsy Ann, who's able to share screen. All right, let's go ahead and uh, switch over to Andrea or to Betsy Ann's share screen because um, we are having some internet challenges from Andrea's. Madam Chair, is this on our, our committee website? It is on, on the committee page. Um, and so if folks are watching on YouTube, they can go to the House Government Operations Committee page. Oh, Betsy Ann, you'd like to be a co-host so you can share screen, hang on. See if I can find Betsy Ann and make her a co-host. Uh, hmm. Well, 
why am I not allowed to make Betsy on a co-host? <laughs> you, you got it? <laughs> okay, here we go. All right, my apologies, Drew. Page oh, two of your document will be coming up in just a moment. It should be back one. Okay. Go. Um, I put this up, uh, the slide, and, and the reason why I wanted to kind of explain this is as we start looking at um, COVID, the, the disaster that we're facing right now, and the impact on EMS services, I think it's important to understand that, again, the majority of services in Vermont are not municipal. Um, these are some uh, slides that were created for uh, the legislature a couple of years ago. And as you can see to the picture to the left with the kind of full-time uh, municipal department, the majority of that funding uh, for those services is actually coming out of municipal dollars versus um, what is uh, the example in the lower uh, right-hand corner, which is Essex, which is a private uh, nonprofit serving multiple communities. The vast majority of their funding is actually coming through uh, Medicaid and Medicare dollars. Uh, so there's a disproportionate effect on the actual revenue streams of these services. And um, in, in a lot of cases, these services do not have the financial um, backing, the depth that a, a municipality does. Uh, once their bank accounts are, are empty, then they're in trouble. So we've had a lot of different effects. And as our annual associations reached out to our membership, as we've talked to services, We've heard everything from loss of workforce, uh, lost fundraising opportunities due to events that have been canceled. Uh, we have some ambulance services that are completely funded uh, based on fundraising in Vermont. Uh, we've heard about lost revenue due to community education because we're no longer allowed to kind of hold these in-person CPR and first aid classes that generates a lot of uh, revenue and uh, a huge loss in billable uh, revenue. And I'll explain that a little bit more in a minute. We've also seen increase in uh, uh, costs, and I think it's important that people understand that ambulance services uh, were required to early on uh, purchase the PPE that we needed, and we're still encouraged to purchase as much PPE through our standard um, vendors as we can, uh, though some equipment is not available, and, and services have spent a significant uh, amount of money. So to, you know, as an example, our service in Brattleboro has spent um, more in the last uh, five weeks on disposable supplies than we have the previous 12 months um, paying for uh, PPE and equipment, uh, as well as disinfection. Something that we don't think about much is the amount of additional time it takes to deal with infectious disease patients. And now that uh, we're treating most every patient as if um, it's an infectious disease patient, the amount of additional work hours, not only on the, um, on the cruise, but on the disinfection and the amount of time it takes to, to go from one call to the next is significantly increased, uh, causing a, a lot of overtime. So if we could scroll to the next page, and there's a lot of numbers on here. So, um, but I thought it would, I would try to explain to you what we deal with every day so that maybe you can understand what we're dealing with today. So uh, this is a, a, round, a rough example, and this is based, um, based on our operation in Brattleboro. So over the course of two months, we run um, about a thousand calls. So um, this is, is oversimplified, but hopefully it gets you to thinking about how ambulance companies uh, stay in business. So the basic uh, formula for this is the number of calls we go times the billing rate equals the revenue. And that fills in the vast majority of um, our operating costs. And on a normal um, scenario, so again, this is oversimplified, um, we have about 18% uh, of our calls where we go out and we don't transport patients at all. And because we don't transport, we can't get paid for those calls. Uh, so our total loss um, in, in revenue um, is the difference between that 500,000 and the 410, and that's $90,000. Um, this is on a on a normal day that we lose to non-transported patients. Uh, in our area right now, 18% um, of patients that do get transported, uh, we also just do not receive any funding for. So out of what should be a $500,000 revenue um, on a normal uh, you know, six, eight week period, uh, we would collect about $336,000, uh, providing about 160, $3,000 worth of uh, free or charitable care. That money is what is made up by the municipal subsidies, fundraising and grant dollars uh, 
uh, in ambulance services in every single community um, in Vermont. If you look down to the yellow section, what COVID has done to this is we've had a drastic decrease in our call volume. Uh, I ran these numbers so that they're uh, accurate in our system. And I've spoken to services all over the state and, and I know these numbers uh, represent what everybody else is seeing. Uh, we had a 42% reduction in calls. Um, we also saw an increase in the number of people that do not want to be transported to the hospital from 18 to 23%. Uh, people are afraid to go to the hospital. So uh, again, ambulance services get paid based on transporting and moving people. So um, you'll see the net reduction from the 410 down to the 224,000. Um, I'm still calculating at 18%, I'm sorry. Um, but the uh, estimate is that we're gonna see a much higher bad debt uh, number than we have before because of the number of people that are uh, currently out of work, unemployed and have large deductibles on their insurance. So in the last uh, six weeks, we've seen $152,000 loss in revenue. That's not money that we're going to see uh, anywhere. That's money we have to make up uh, in our operating budget uh, somehow in, um, in the future or expenses that have to be cut. So to put this into perspective, for people that are um, rescue serves uh, 15 towns, about 500 square miles, about 32,000 people. And usually at the end of our uh, fiscal year, um, we're somewhere in the you know two to $10,000, um, either plus or minus um, our operating budget. And in the last six weeks, um, we've fallen $152,000 behind. Uh, so when we said this is a crisis, this is a crisis for EMS um, across uh, the state. So there have been some direct funds that have come through the Agency of Human Services um, as far as uh, offsets to help with uh, Medicare money that has been lost. So uh, we were fortunate to get uh, about 80,000 um, from HHS as part of the CARES package. Um, to, to kind of fill in a little bit of that $152,000 hole. Uh, we also have applied for many of the other programs that, that um, small businesses have in Vermont in order to help us keep, uh, kind of keep the doors open and the ambulances um, out and running. But it is a real issue and the longer the um, pandemic goes on, the longer the call volume stays, uh, the more difficult it is going to be to fill in the in the voids. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, I'll tell you about the education component. So, and this is information uh, that was put out as part of our EMS advisory report. I think you guys have that uh, already. Should have gotten it earlier. Um, workforce development has been our number one priority for our EMS advisory committee for the last couple of years, and. It's because of the numbers in the chart. We're losing and turning over 20% of our workforce every year. Um, we need to, uh, first of all, we need to figure out how to retain people because losing 20% of our workforce is not sustainable. Uh, and the second component uh, of that is uh, we're seeing um, usually year over year between five and 10% increases in our call volume. And we've seen a steady decline in the number of responders we have in Vermont. Uh, you'll see the quotes from the advisory report um, 80 percent of services pre-COVID were reporting workforce um, shortages, uh, poor access to education, increased costs. Um, what we expect now is even worse. Uh, what services did have available for uh, funds to help support education, as you saw on the previous slide, uh, doesn't exist. What individuals had for willingness and available funds to pay for their own education we can only imagine um, will not exist post COVID. Um, the EMS office has put out a survey to the districts uh, looking for uh, input, input on the status. And I put some quotes there from last week's uh, report. And I, if I had a bigger slide, I could have put more. Um, but the point is we are seeing uh, losses in EMS providers directly related to COVID. So I believe, and most other administrators uh, believe that that uh, 400 uh, person loss in EMS is gonna be significantly greater this year 
as a result, direct result of the COVID um, crisis. Um, and that's why I think it's very important that we get <clears throat> uh, funding for uh, EMS. Um, is there questions? All right. Committee, do you have any questions? Rob LeClaire, go ahead. Thank you, Madam. Hold on. Can you hear me? I yes. can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you. Sorry, I got to catch up with my screen. Um, Drew, I got a, a couple of questions. One, um, do you have kind of a cumulative number that we're looking at statewide? If you're saying that you're 152,000, just your service, we, we must be a million plus dollars in need, aren't we, for one. And two, um, if you've had a declining in, in run volume, um, does that 152,000 that you show that you've lost, does that include decreased expenses as far as, or have you seen a decrease in expenses as far as not having to pay overtime or backfilling shifts and stuff? So, uh, unfortunately, the decrease in run volume has not decreased the overall uh, cost of operating because the cost of, of readiness is there. So we have to have the staff on in order to meet the need of uh, the calls when they do come. So uh, if people would schedule their emergencies better, we could probably lean down the staff, but um, they don't seem to, to work that way. Uh, what we have seen is an increase in our overall costs. So uh, at this point, uh, we have over 30,000 in additional uh, expenditures related directly to purchasing of PPE uh, and equipment uh, related to COVID. So um, if, and, and it kind of the, we have applied for the PPP program one of the challenges with that PPP program is that you have to maintain staffing. Um, so um, we will be maintaining the staffing for at least the, the next couple of months as part of the program. And uh, I know like uh, that us and other services are gonna have to seriously look at our ability to maintain uh, workforce if the call volume doesn't increase and if the revenue doesn't um, come back and what that means for or um, the towns that we serve are um, longer response times and possibly you know no ambulances available to respond to their calls because we don't have the crews on. Rob, is that does that complete your questions? There we go. Thank you. Mike Merwicky has a question. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. R Rob pretty much touched on what I was asking about how uh, I, I appreciate that we're getting the, the view from Wyndham County, but uh, the big picture I think is what we need to, to know as well is what we're gonna need, or what they're gonna need for resources looking, <clears throat> looking statewide. The other piece I, I wanted, wanted to ask Drew is um, the, how timely are these needs or what's the timeline? I think the last time you talked to us at the Wyndham County delegation, you talked about how your your cash flow is is getting pretty darn tight. So, can you can you give us an update for you and and what others around the state are experiencing? So, um, yeah. So when I spoke to the Wyndham County delegation, um, that was uh, ahead of our um, HHS uh, payment, which certainly helped and the loan that we got under the, the uh, Paycheck Protection Act. Um, so currently our cash flow is stabilized for the next uh, eight weeks under the federal program. And we will, I mean, between now and the end of that eight weeks, we'll have to figure out how we're either going to um, maintain or, or change the, the staffing levels. Um, I did speak to uh, at least a half a dozen other services in the last uh, couple of weeks that have also received the HHS money. Um, and I was actually speaking to a service, a smaller service this morning uh, that was successful at getting their PPP money. So my understanding right now is that most ambulance services have been successful at getting the kind of the temporary 
federal funding to keep them operating in the short term. On the education side, um, one of our fears and the EMS Advisory Committee has is, is discussed this um, and continues to discuss it uh, as one of our priorities is the longer that we wait to start restart our education system, the longer we're gonna be before we can get the workforce out um, and, and fill in some of the, the holes and the gaps that we have. So the sooner we can um, get the funding and infrastructure in place and the advisory committee is uh, ready and willing to stand up um, whatever we need to in order to get EMS education in Vermont, um, the, the better we're going to be. It takes uh, between three and six months to get a, a new person through an education um, program. So if, if we wait for the end of the COVID response, uh, it's gonna be way too late for us to keep these services uh, responding. Thanks, Drew. Uh, Mike, does that, does that satisfy your questions? So Mike, you got to lower your hand. So I've got Jim with a hand raised and then Hal. Go ahead, Jim Harrison. Yeah, thanks, um, Madam Chair. Um, Drew, if it, it sounds like most of the services might have um, qualified for the PPP or whatever the acronym is, um, is that fair to say? So the ones I've spoken to have applied. Um, a lot of them have the money, uh, but there are smaller services that we have not been able to get in touch with at this point. So I can't tell you that it's 100%, uh, but I do know that the, out of all the angel services I've spoken to, um, they have been eligible and have received the funds. And plus some may have gotten some extra help with the Medicaid uh, shortcomings. Is that also what you're saying? So the Medicare um, put out- I'm sorry, Medicare. I, th I thought it was yeah. Medicaid, okay. And that was an automatic payment. So services did not have to per, uh, apply for that program. So our assumption is that every uh, provider that bills Medicare in Vermont um, did receive that as a payment to their, um, in their checking accounts, the same as they would their, their normal Medicare money. Uh, I know of a couple of services that have applied for Medicaid money. Uh, I don't know of any that have received any. Okay, thank you. So I'm, I'm just trying to ascertain right now, and I was, you know, the, the outsider that crashed your Wyndham meeting there a few weeks ago. Um, and thank you for the education you provided, uh, at least for me. But I'm, I'm trying to get at is, you know, we've got really limited resources right now statewide. Um, and we don't, I guess, know exactly what COVID funds can be used for and what they can't be. Um, is the primary concern today um, the lack of training resources to help with the next um, uh, number of people that we need to fill ranks? Or is it the cash flow issue um, where the alarm bells were going off a few weeks? And for your service, it sounds like some of that's been at least temporarily resolved through the uh, federal COVID program. So, yes. Um, so you're, the emergency as far as the cash flow for our service and um, some of the other services I know has been uh, mitigated with the, the short term uh, solution, uh, but we do need to find a, um, a more long term solution, uh, whether that's a, adjusting our, our Medicaid rates, whether that's funding uh, directly for ambulance services, uh, we do need to find a long term solution because the, the federal PPP money, unless it um, is, is renewed, will run out long before the COVID sure. response does. Uh, the funding for education um, is going to be critical in order for us to come out of this um, COVID response with a functioning EMS system. So if we can't get that uh, the funding up or that funding approved and that, that system up and running, we're not going to be able to recover from this. Um, 
Okay, thank you. Okay. Hal, did you have a question? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Drew, for this overview. Um, do you have any sense um, how the EMS providers are faring in New Hampshire and or Maine? Are they having similar challenges? And if so, how are they approaching it? So um, I know that they're having similar challenges. Uh, we are a border service, so I receive um, a lot of the New Hampshire communication. I can't speak to um, Maine. So uh, in New Hampshire, they're struggling with the same uh, numbers of uh, reduced call volume and reduced revenue. Um, I know Massachusetts has um, increased their Medicaid rates uh, by 50% to help address some of the uh, funding shortfall to ambulance services. Um, so they're having the same problem in Massachusetts and their approach has been to increase Medicaid to help offset some of those losses. And I just, just got to note, uh, Maine has also increased uh, Medicaid rates uh, to 100% of Medicare in order to meet the need of uh, services. Thank you. Yep. John Gannon. Thank you. Um, Drew, um, you haven't really mentioned the Emergency Medical Services Special Fund and how that could help with education. So the special fund uh, was created and uh, distributes about $9,000 a year to each of the EMS districts. And it has been uh, doing that for quite some time for EMS education. Uh, what we were working to, to do this year was to uh, address the, the difficulty in access and the kind of the shortfall in education dollars, which is what um, uh, House 742 um, addressed. And that was as a result of the study committee, um, the emergency uh, medical services uh, committee was work looking at and, and researching what was causing the decline in our workforce. So the money that was in the fund uh, or the money that currently is in the fund is money that was intended for um, EMS districts that was never distributed to them generally because the amount of administrative uh, work in order to get the funding uh, was difficult. Many of our EMS services are small uh, volunteer, completely volunteer operations. They don't have administrative overhead or administrative staff to fill out the applications and the grant funding. So a lot of the money that was available is money that was supposed to have gone to districts, but they were un unable to get it because of the kind of the paperwork shuffle in order to get those funds. So we were uh, looking to get funding directly for EMS uh, education, specifically EMT classes and online education for uh, EMS as part of uh, H742. Um, last week, our EMS advisory committee met um, looking to get some sort of uh, distributive education uh, up and running as soon as we can so that we can start filling in what we know are, are huge holes in our workforce. Uh, so the committee uh, agreed to have to the kind of the concept that the EMS office was going to get some proposals together on ways to um, get online EMS education out to our, um, our services as soon as possible. So at this point, I, I think the EMS office is very close to a kind of like an online structure and hopefully we'll be moving forward with education uh, soon. This is not something new in Vermont. Um, we've been running online education in, in some areas. UVM currently has multiple EMT classes that are running as hybrid models. So it's it's been done. It just needs to be expanded so that we can have access to kind of all corners of of Vermont and hopefully uh, kind of fill in some of those gaps as we're working the way through the rest of this pandemic response. Any other questions, John? So Drew, let me ask, yeah, I just have one other question. So I'm reading the, the statute um, 18 VSA section 908 and in subsection B it says, 
Um, the Commissioner of Health shall develop and implement by September 1st, 2012 online training opportunities and offer regional classes to enable individuals to comply with the requirements, blah, blah, blah. Was that done? So the EMS office maintains uh, a program that's called CenterLearn where um, there are some continuing education components. Um, it's also where uh, education is, um, some of the protocol education is rolled out. Um, that platform has never been used for initial uh, certification or for uh, recertification, which are the two biggest components associated with uh, EMS education. And just, I think it's important to know that the um, state training coordinator position at the EMS office has been vacant um, with the exception of, of 12 months for almost six years, uh, which is one of the identified challenges that our EMS advisory committee um, looked at as one of the reasons why we're struggling so much to get uh, appropriate education to EMS. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Committee, any other questions for Drew? All right, I will just, um, oh, Rob LeClaire, go ahead. Hand up. Hand Thank down. you, Madam Chair. Uh, Drew, uh, I don't know if I heard, do you have an estimate as to what we're looking at statewide as far as a shortfall? So uh, we did, uh, a very informal survey to the EMS, uh, to the ambulance services across the state. And uh, actually, can I answer that in just a minute? That way I can get the exact number for you. I'll pull it up. More accurate, sure. better. <laughs> <laughs> Good me question. We'll, uh, we'll give you a few minutes to, to dig around for that, Drew. Um, in the meantime, uh, we have um, Dan Batesy, who is the Emergency Medical Services Chief at the Department of Health. And so, uh, Dan, if you would uh, join us and help us understand um, what, uh, what's going on from your perspective. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the committee for having time for me this afternoon. Uh, and Drew, thanks very much for uh, a concise picture. I think he's done a very good job of describing a lot of the crisis that we're facing these days. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's true. Uh, there's a lot of challenges in front of EMS, uh, education being a big one. And uh, I, I'd like to reiterate the, the, the picture that Drew put. We do lose about 24% of our population every year to folks who move on to other jobs and to retire. And to replace them, we've got to bring in somewhere in the order of about 500 providers. And that's, uh, we've been pretty good at it. We've been good for the last five years. We've had roughly a, a net zero in terms of loss of, of folks. Um, but that means we've got to have a sustained education program and keep it going. And COVID-19 has uh, created a pretty significant challenge to that. Now, this is not a new program, a new problem rather. We've been talking about this and, and Drew alluded to this fact, but even before COVID, we were working with the advisory committee to work on some of these long-term education programs. And I wholeheartedly agree that it is uh, some degree of insanity to continue asking people to pay to train to then go on and volunteer. Uh, I, I think that's a, a flawed model as we, as we look ahead to sustaining a volunteer system. So uh, prior to the COVID-19 response, we were working with the advisory committee to do just that. Uh, we had the notion of centralizing some measure of education in Vermont. Um, uh, we had some idea of, of underwriting at least a portion of the cost of training for folks who were going to dedicate themselves to the volunteer ambulances and to the volunteer services out there. And we were working with that. Uh, we've been talking for a long time about an online education model uh, where uh, multiple districts with varying infrastructures could uh, use these, uh, these centralized resources to bring education to the places that uh, otherwise they don't get there. And that's certainly been the challenge, right? Um, uh, Drew alluded to the fact that using that special fund has been difficult. And it's not just the paperwork that's been the difficulty, although certainly the administrative aspects of it have been uh, a limitation to distributing those funds. But it's also um, 
being handed to districts that have very limited infrastructure in some cases. Um, we have districts that have a lot of infrastructure. Uh, Drew's district has, uh, with, his, with the good graces of his agency, have a lot of capability to provide education and to train. But in other districts, uh, districts that have one or two services, they have very limited capability to put on EMT classes and very limited uh, folks to teach and to, to provide the resources that are necessary for an EMT class. And yes, $9,000 is nice, but uh, if you look at the cost of an EMT class, it costs somewhere in the order of almost $650 a student to simply put the class on. So if you're talking about a class full of 20 students, that $9,000 doesn't even cover that cost. So then the, uh, the cost goes to the students who have limited capacity to pay and so on goes the cycle. And, and that's the challenge that we faced. I think a lot of the fact that the special fund has been underutilized is less to do with administrative paperwork as it is to the fact that districts just kind of look at it and say, we, we can't do this. We're, we don't have a, a good outcome at the end of this. So why are we continuing to push all these resources towards it when it's a, a limited capability. And that of course is the challenge of trying to get the education to exactly the places where we need it the most, the remote uh, uh, low population areas that need providers on a regular basis that need them in many cases more than the, the high population areas do. So we've been working on that. In fact, we've, we've changed the process of, of, of of going out and putting the money out, uh, the, the application process, if you will. We changed it four times in the four years that I've been here. We've created um, uh, uh, templates and models to make it happen, but the challenges are still existing. And, and I think that, uh, that uh, this is an ongoing issue. Um, before COVID, we had talked about the idea that maybe this is just not the right way to do it, that maybe there was a better mousetrap to be had and that means creating this centralized infrastructure to take the take the the role of some of these districts that just don't have the capabilities to do it themselves. And then COVID nineteen hit, <laughs> and um, that changed everything for us. Uh, you know, our entire operation at the Department of Health shifted to response. Every single person that had a moment of thought to think about EMS was now shifted into the health operations center and. You know, that included not just EMS, but managing the hospitals and the long-term care facilities and the outbreaks and all of that happened. And for the last two months, we've been pretty darn busy trying to make sure that all of those things happened. Um, but nonetheless, we've tried to keep up. We've tried to, to do the things that we needed to do to, to, to meet those. Um, of course, the biggest issues in the response have been other things besides education. You know, we've had to create a PPE distribution system uh, that's given out uh, uh, 18,000 pieces of personal protective equipment per day for the last two months. Uh, we basically invented Amazon.com from nothing to a full functioning corporation in just a little more than a month and a half. So um, that's been a huge challenge. And then we've had the social distancing issues where the infrastructure that we normally would stand up for an EMT class, that is having people in a classroom and being evaluated with hands-on skills, we, we just couldn't do that anymore. It just wasn't, uh, wasn't appropriate in the context of the pandemic to do that. And that's been a, a pretty, pretty big challenge. Now we've worked hard to try to fix a lot of those things. We've uh, uh, certainly stood up a, a fair bit of resources on our end. We brought another person into the office to to work as the acting uh, training administrator to help us with some of these issues. We have uh, uh, made a lot of changes. We, we've uh, increased the, uh, well, we've pushed back, I should say, the licensure renewal date for folks who are recertifying their license this year. That's gone back for a, a three month period. We've uh, uh, changed the requirements for an ambulance crew. We've uh, uh, used to be a two, a two licensed provider rule. We waived that rule in the context of the, of the pandemic to just one, to enable agencies to use drivers and to use volunteers uh, that aren't fully trained to sustain their operations. And I think that's been successful. We've changed how testing uh, requirements are, are uh, we have changed the requirements of testing. Uh, around licensure systems so that students who have already been partially through a class had some capability to come back and uh, complete their, uh, to obtain a provisional license uh, so that they can, again, feed into the operation as well. Um, 
And then, of course, we've had to address the day-to-day -day stuff that's going on, and that's been a matter of trying to keep people informed, and we've done that with a variety of different mechanisms and means. We've uh, had a, a, a weekly phone call for first response agencies. We've done a weekly email. We've done uh, a daily situation report from the SEOC, trying to make sure that all of the opportunities for funding, like the Medicaid retainer and the FEMA grants and uh, a number of other opportunities are, are tried to be pushed out there as timely as we, as we possibly could. Um, and then, of course, we had to address the education piece. And uh, Drew's absolutely right. Uh, if, we, if we don't act on education, we're going to be not just three months in the hole, but um, we are going to be in a hole of people because we've got to sustain that roughly four to 500 people every year to keep our ranks at a net zero. So what we've had in mind, and we've been working with the uh, advisory committee on this as well, is to try to do a COVID-19 EMT program that combines distributive mechanisms. Um, uh, that would mean that a, a portion of the program would be done online and then to, to backlog, uh, to, to push to the end of the class, the hands-on and the psychomotor capabilities that are, are required. I mean, we can't take an EMT class without learning some hands-on skills. It's just really not possible. But what we figure is that we can put people into this program and then work with local infrastructure later to complete that training so that when the restrictions are lifted and we're very hopeful that they'll be lifted uh, in a relatively soon fashion, um, that when they're lifted, we can then get these folks into the system faster. So that is they're not waiting for three months to start a program and to begin anew. Um, so that's what we've had in mind with the advisory committee. And that uh, is where we worked with them to try to utilize some of those uh, unspent special funds uh, to pay for this. We've also had the notion that this class uh, in the time of the COVID response should be underwritten and should be a very low cost. And in fact, at this particular moment, we're talking about making it about $100 to take this class. We uh, would like to make it free, but our concern, of course, is that when we make it entirely free, no one has skin in the game. And that means a little bit of difficulty keeping students uh, properly and uh, 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 aligned to classes and things like that. So we have in mind that we're going to charge about $100 and then use the rest of the money to offset the costs. Um, our plan is to use an, an existing vendor uh, that's out there. We've been working with the state of Maine. Uh, we've also worked with the state of Massachusetts and New York uh, to look and see what they're doing. Maine is probably doing the closest thing to what we have in mind uh, with an online hybrid EMT class, and we're uh, trying to model what we're looking for there. Um, it's our intent to put out, as Drew mentioned, um, not really a request for proposal, but a review statement uh, to uh, four, possibly five programs, in two, including two here in Vermont that we believe have the capability to, to do the things that we need to do. That is the, the online infrastructure and the online um, uh, uh, previous experience working with that platform to be able to, to do these things. Um, uh, our review process is finished. We're hoping to get uh, some of these programs under review by the end of this week. And uh, if, if not fully into next week, uh, we'll be looking at that. Our goal is to select a program by the 20th of May and then begin enrolling students for the end of June. And that would serve then as our hybrid program and allow uh, at least some EMT education to occur during the COVID-19 response. Um, our hope also is that this can serve as um, a type of review, a, a pilot project, if you will, to see about long-term feasibility, because it would make sense to me at least, and, and I'm not only the EMS chief, but I'm a, a longtime EMS educator. I spent nearly 20 years as a paramedic program director before I came to Vermont. It would seem to me that this makes sense from a, from a centralized standpoint, that this is a, a model that we need. This is the model that might work uh, as we recruit students into our system. Now, I want to be clear that we don't want to step on all of the infrastructure in Vermont and shift it to this because there's a need for other types of education. Uh, UVM, for example, trains a good many students that will never see the back of a, a Vermont EMS ambulance. They're the ones that are, uh, you know, going to their home states and, 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 and working there. Um, but they still also train a whole lot of Vermont EMS providers too. So we want to make sure that we sustain them. 
And I think that if we can prove the feasibility of this, I think if we can pr prove that it works and that it's a manageable system, this might be the answer to having some measure of full-time annual programming that volunteer agencies can turn to there where that special fund money can be spent very effectively and, and uh, with good utility. So we're, we're hoping that will start immediately. Now the challenge as we go on is of course sustaining it, right? Um, we'll have uh, uh, money in the special fund right now that unspent uh, balance to pay for this, but we're looking at probably somewhere in the order of about $1,000 an EMT student to run this on a, on a regular basis. Now, again, I don't have an exact number because we haven't had any proposals yet. We don't have anything to review yet, uh, but that's based on estimates from Maine and Massachusetts. That's how much students are paying right now. So we're estimating it's gonna be somewhere in that order. And we're gonna to have to look at that in, in terms of what our annual goals are. Again, I don't think that we're gonna train all 400 EMS students every single year using this model, but if we could train 150, if we could train a couple hundred that would certainly go a long way to, to sustaining the ranks of the volunteer population, especially if we made it preferential to those volunteer candidates based on recommendations and service chief uh, approval, things like that. Um, so there, that's the next piece that we'll have to begin to look at. And we'll continue to work with the advisory committee on, uh, on what their vision is and how to best roll this out. And then finally, uh, I think the challenge that we're gonna also be faced with is how do we look to the future and how do we uh, find a reimbursement model for EMS that doesn't get them into a challenge every time we have a situation like this, every time call volume drops. And by the way, you know, the, uh, although we're, we're certainly highlighting COVID as a problem here with this reimbursement model, the reimbursement model was flawed way before COVID ever came around. Uh, and the notion that um, being paid only for transporting people doesn't pay you to train. It doesn't pay you to be prepared. And it certainly does a disservice to those folks who transport very few people all the time. The fact of the matter is if you live in Brighton and get hit by a car, you want to have the same EMS standard as you do in Burlington. But we know that the folks in Brighton are transporting a heck of a lot less people than the folks in Burlington are. So we've got to figure that out. And uh, I think there's some, some interesting models out there. I think there's some interesting ways to think about it, but that's going to have to be a project as we look forward. So I think that's pretty much where I'm coming from. Uh, I'm certainly happy to entertain your questions. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate that. Committee, do you have questions? All right, I am not, oh, Rob LeClaire has a question. Go ahead, Rob. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Dan, you know, one of the, the, you made the comment that, you know, if somebody needs an EMS service in Allen Pond, that you want the same as in say Burlington. And that in itself seems to have been some of the challenges that, that people have in that as much as we would like that to be the case, I would rather just have somebody qualified to show up rather than nobody at all. Um, are, are we making it more difficult and less attractive for people to become part of the MS service by having these, I guess, criteria out there that in some cases I, I think are acting as a deterrent for folks. Yeah, thank you, Representative. And that's a very good point. Uh, you're correct. Um, Island Pond doesn't have a 300,000 volume library either. Uh, and the taxpayers in, in that municipality have decided that's what they're happy with. Uh, and I think it's very reasonable um, that people make educated decisions about the level of EMS that they choose. And there are different levels. Uh, maybe you don't need a Cadillac, maybe a Chevy will do. Uh, and I think, I think that's a very reasonable conversation to have as long as people are educated about it, as long as they understand what they're, what they're getting. I think one of the big challenges we have in EMS is it's like sausage and laws is that nobody really wants to understand how it's made. And, fully in Vermont, very few people really understand what they have already. 
when most people imagine EMS agencies, they think of a fire department with a pole and people sliding down and being in the station 24 hours a day. They don't imagine the volunteers with the pager on their belt getting up from Thanksgiving dinner and rushing to the ambulance station to, to get the ambulance out. Um, so I think we have some education to do and, and Drew has presented you some slides that we created just for that purpose, uh, for the purpose of educating the stakeholders on, on what that means. Um, now, to come back to your original question, however, uh, I think you're right. And I think there is such a thing as, as creating standards that are too high. I think there's a, a situation where if we make the entry level um, uh, too uh, sophisticated, then we, loot, we stop it from being an entry level. Uh, and people in, on the EMS side will hear me argue this about at meetings all the time when we're doing a, a, a protocol update right now, as a matter of fact, and all of the EMS folks would like to have every you know, fancy gadget and new medication and new thing at their level. But I say all the time that if we keep adding and adding and adding, um, an entry level class isn't entry anymore. Um, I think we've done a pretty decent job of balancing um, minimum standard from uh, the best and the brightest. Uh, in fact, in the last five years, uh, the standards, the annual recertification standards have actually gone down. Uh, they did when we changed over to the National Continued Competency Model with the National Registry five years ago. Uh, it actually reduced the number of hours that were acquired every year. But I do appreciate what you're saying, and I do think it's important that we don't lose sight of that, and that if we make this initial training class a thousand hours long, uh, no one will take it to volunteer. Uh, and I think we have to be cognizant of that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, committee, any other questions? So Mari or um, David, if, is there anything that um, think we should know that hasn't been um, brought to light here based on your history with this, uh, this subject? Mari, go ahead and unmute yourself. It sounds like what I've been hearing from my constituents, including um, from Bristol Rescue, um, including about the PPE um, and the training. Um, and I just wanna put a plug in too, I um, have been reading uh, the Senate bill that's in your committee now. And um, if you do move forward with that in some form, um, House Healthcare had um, put reporting requirements in our bill and um, we would appreciate that um, if you have any reporting requirements that house health care be included. Oh, excellent idea. Thank you. I didn't think about that. Uh, okay. Committee, any other questions for any of the folks who've testified so far? Go ahead, Hal. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, a question for Mari. In your testimony, you mentioned um, some concerns around equity with regards to training. And just wondering if you can say more about that, like what's being done to address it. Thank you. Um, I drew the testimony um, from Drew Hazelton. Um, we learned that the, the, just the process by which um, funds for training were, um, were allocated was inequitable. And I think part of that was the, um, the application process um, being onerous, especially for the, the very small services that only have one or two people um, and applying for the, the funding was a challenge. And um, I, that might be something that um, Drew could, could speak to as well. Do you have any thoughts, Drew? So that is um, accurate as far as <clears throat> getting the, the available training dollars. Um, the other uh, difficulty that uh, we have heard is you take a, a, especially a smaller area where um, education is not being offered. So um, our area, for example, um, we have a concentration in our Brattleboro area, so classes are quite often held in Brattleboro, 
but we have services that are are very small where people are are coming home from work and then having to spend an hour driving to um, their class location and an hour home. So you take a three hour class on a typical evening, uh, turns into a, a five hour commitment two days a week and every Saturday. And with the original um, bill, one of the, the goals was to uh, make it more equitable, equitable by having that online education component so that now, at least if they're committing to that three hour class, uh, they're only committing three hours and not that additional two hours of travel. So there is equity in the uh, distribution of funds as well as the availability of classes. And then the third area was uh, access to testing, uh, which requires um, new EMTs to travel to um, a handful of, of sites, either in the state or out of the state for their written exam. And then many of them having to travel uh, from one corner of the state to another for their practical exam. And those were kind of the inequities that we were working on um, and addressing as part of the original House bill and the original Senate bill that we were working on. I do have the information on the other question when you're ready. Yes, go ahead. So the question on um, total losses. So we did a, a survey of services and this information is a couple weeks old now. Uh, but out of a total of uh, 22 services serving 238,000 uh, Vermonters, their projected losses were uh, 630,000. Um, and that was for this uh, current six week period that we're in or uh, roughly um, $2.75 for $3 per capita um, is what the estimated loss to ambulance services uh, currently is. Excellent. Thank you for looking that up. Um, Mari, did you want to add something to that? Yes, to the previous conversation, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Drew, but I think also one of the, the issues that you mentioned was um, the existing position of the street state training coordinator not having been filled for um, fully for most of the last four to six years, um, and that having um, a state training coordinator position filled would help with the standardization of education and would help with the equity issue. That, um, that's absolutely a contributing factor. So as part of EMS uh, education, uh, we have instructor coordinators and uh, typically the state training coordinator works with those uh, instructor coordinators to make sure that the quality um, is of education is where it should be and the access to education is where it should be. And during the period of time where we had a state training coordinator, we did uh, start working on um, some of those, those problems. Um, that is an area that the EMS advisory committee did identify a you know, significant uh, void as a lack of kind of consistent leadership in the state training uh, role. So there are areas of the state that don't have instructor coordinators at all. And by lacking that um, qualification, that makes them ineligible to host classes. So you know, there are entire districts that um, don't have the ability to host classes, even if we uh, gave them the funds at this point. All right. Um, Rob LeClaire. Thank you. Um, so Drew, you said it, the, currently the deficit's about 630,000, but that information's a couple weeks old. So the, it was 630,000 um, as compiled for 22 services serving 238,000 people. So uh, we have data only from a fraction of uh, the state. Right, and you said that number in itself even was still a couple weeks old. So yeah, we used, uh, so this information I got from the ambulance services two weeks ago, and it was basing their, it was projected losses uh, based on the call volume uh, decreases that we were seeing at that time. Mm -hmm. um, I can say for our organization, uh, it was 10% uh, understated when we projected it out two weeks ago. 
Um, so I would assume that the other uh, services are probably similar to that uh, under projecting about 10%. So I'm just from a, a projection standpoint here, it looks like that it, it wouldn't be unreasonable to think that EMS services are, are going in the whole roughly to tune of a hundred thousand dollars a week. Is, would that be a fairly close number potentially? Uh, for those, sir, uh, for that subset of services that reported, yes. So there's okay. still um, a lot of services. So there's you know, 90 services in Vermont that did not report. Yeah. Um, and some of those services are the larger municipal services. Um, that, have the concerns report? about revenue. I'm sorry? That didn't report? Correct. So there, for example, uh, Burlington Fire, um, their concerns about revenue are very different because they are uh, a municipal service. So if they don't have the, the revenue coming in, it doesn't um, affect them the same way as it does uh, somebody like an Upper Valley or a Rescue Inc. So the municipal departments did not uh, give us projections, which is why we were using the number of 22 services and the population served as a, uh, as a way to project what that would look like across the rest of the state. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Committee, any other questions? All right. Um, we have uh, we have a little bit of time now for some open committee conversation. Um, I think what I'd like to do is ask Betsy Ann if you can give us an update on um, what it is that the Senate decided to do with this topic, um, and uh, and that way we can understand what might be coming for next steps in the conversation. Thank you. Hi, uh, for the record, Betsy Ann Rask, Legislative Council. Um, so I think it was on that last day at the State House, the Senate passed out S-124, which uh, was a general public safety bill covering law enforcement, um, dispatch, and then emergency medical services. And they proposed miscellaneous amendments in regard to EMS, and then what they did was they took out the ones that they thought should be addressed immediately in regard to EMS. And that's what came uh, over to you in S-182 um, that uh, removed credentialing and extended the ambulance license terms and required the DFR direct uh, enforcement of direct reimbursement to um, ambulance services. What was not included is the appropriation amount um, the bill that they were working on, S-124, would have appropriated $450,000 um, from the EMS special fund that was expected to be there for the next fiscal year, FY21, and then an additional $400,000 um, from the general fund to go to DOH for EMS personnel training. So that bill is currently sitting in... Um, Senate approves. That's its current status. In the meantime, the uh, other thing that the Senate committee did was to write a letter to the Department of Health just requesting that the department use the funds that are currently available in that special fund um, to assist EMS. At that time, I think that was a, a, a memo that went out a week ago to the Department of Health, um, asking them to use what they understood at the time to be um, approximately $377,000 of for, uh, carry forward in the EMS special fund um, to be dispersed immediately to EMS providers. Um, I, I don't know the current status of what the department is planning to do with that. Thankfully, we have the department here, um, but um, that's the current state of things from the Senate side was just that memo requesting that whatever funds are available be used. And then there's just an ongoing um, uh, request for the General Assembly to appropriate additional funds 
um, to go to EMS training. Thank you, Betsy Ann. I appreciate the the review. So, committee, do you um, do you have any questions for any of the folks that we've heard from? Uh, we could also um, dig a little more deeply into any of these issues if you'd like. All right, nobody's jumping. Mike Merwicki, go right ahead. Oh, John, are you John Gannon? Are you still having trouble getting your hand to raise? John has no little blue hand today. Okay, so let's go with Mike, and then I'll go to John Gannon. Uh, I'll defer to John. Okay, John Gannon, go ahead. Uh, so we do have people from the Department of Health on our our Zoom call today. Um, is there a is there going to be a response to Senate GovOps's letter about the use of um, reserve funds? That's a great question. And I don't know whether Dan or Shayla would like to respond to that. I, I can respond to that. Sorry, let me get my video to go back here. Thank you, Shayla. Um, so we did, I did respond to the chair um, after that letter went out, but um, and Drew and Dan can speak to the conversation that was had, but the EMS Advisory Council did meet. And um, as you've heard over the last hour or so, the decision was made there that those funds would be probably better used going towards the statewide online training option. Um, but again, I'll, I'll hand that over to Dan, but I did wanna let you know that we did communicate that to the, to the chair. Thank you. Dan. Yeah, I think I would just echo what Shayla just said, is that in the last meeting of the AMS Advisory Committee, we asked them to use the funds for the education. I think um, uh, that it would be a, a, certainly a better usage of the funds. It would sustain, it's, it's, the, it's the notion of teaching a person to fish rather than giving him a fish uh, would be how I would describe it. Um, but I'm certainly willing to, to, uh, to deploy the, the, those funds at the, at the whim of the advisory committee. If they would like to do it differently, we can certainly look at other models. And so, Dan, as I understand, so this is for the COVID-19 EM, EMT training program you referenced earlier in your test? That's right. Okay. And Drew, is the advisory council comfortable with this approach? So, um, there's some question as to how much uh, funding is available. We were um, made aware that, that that had been spent down to just over 200,000. Um, and we did have a discussion a week ago, just over a week ago, um, about uh, dividing that as a direct kind of appropriation to ambulance services and what that would, that 100,000 divided up amongst the ambulance services would mean to the um, you know, deficit uh, that services are facing, uh, which would not be significant in, in kind of filling that void. And it was uh, agreed uh, by the advisory committee that we would be better to immediately spend that money to get uh, education up and running uh, in Vermont. And, you know, we're hopeful and I'll certainly um, schedule another advisory meeting so that we can get that done as soon as we can. Uh, workforce development was our number one priority. Uh, based on the needs of the services. And I think it's going to continue to be our number one priority moving forward. So, Drew, just so I understand your um, testimony, so you believe the money has been spent down to about $200,000. But, and you said you wanted to split between training and a direct reimbursement to the various EMS services, or, or you just want it for training? I just want to make sure I understand what your recommendation is. So the committee does not recommend that the money uh, as a direct rec or a direct um, payment to EMS services. Uh, that question was raised, the committee said no. Um, the amount of money uh, would, would be better used uh, to prop up uh, workforce development. Um, 
and it is our belief that there's just over uh, $200,000 uh, versus the 370 uh, that, that was available. So can Dan or Shayla explain what the balance is in the reserve fund? as of today? Sure. So um, I'm going to get an exact number. Uh, also, uh, Senator White wanted an exact number from us on what is in that um, now. I have, of course, what was in it on July 1st, 2019, but that's not as useful. So I'll get that in an email to the chair for the committee. So uh, do you believe it's been depleted from 370000 to something less than that? No. I don't think it's been largely depleted. I think it is around that number, but we will get you an exact number. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, John, for those questions. Um, Rob LeClaire and then Mike Merwicki. Um. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I guess I got a couple questions around this. I'm, I guess it's a matter of priorities here, but I, I'm hearing that we've ambulance services that are real fiscal um, difficulty, and it would seem to me that we're better off to address that issue. Um, even a best care, what I've heard here today is thousand dollars a week. And I recognize we're talking about a limited amount of money here. But, um, if, if continuing education isn't going to really be needed if, if you don't have answers that you have to continue to educate. And does the health department or any other agency have some short-term funding options available here going forward? Because let's say this continues on for at least another month. What do we do we now and I, I don't know if it would be Sheila or Dan that could weigh in on this. Sure. So I'll give it a shot and then hand it over to Dan. Um, so as you heard Drew say earlier, um, we have been pushing out all of the different um, federal opportunities that have been available, not just to EMS, but also to other uh, small healthcare providers. And um, I do want to just take a minute to step back and say that the, um, you know, the issues facing EMS are unique in that, you know, they were already having problems, particularly with recruitment prior to COVID, but that small healthcare providers across the state are struggling in the same way due to a much decreased volume um, in patient care. So this is not um, only affecting EMS providers, this is the same thing that I'm sure you're hearing from constituents across the state and other healthcare settings. There are multiple different ways in which providers can um, apply for funding, and we have been pushing those out to EMS um, agencies uh, so that they're aware of those different um, funding streams. And as you heard Drew say, quite a number of them have applied and received funding. Um, so that's sort of the what, what is happening right now on the ground. Going forward, we do need to come up with a new way in which to um, reimburse EMS. That is something that has to has to happen um, in the future, as you've heard Dan say, and we are going to look into that and, and try to think about creative and new ways to do reimbursement. We are also monitoring um, EMS agencies and the EMS program is sending out surveys and um, getting information every week from the agencies to ensure that we know what is happening on the ground for them. Um, so those are the things that are happening right now in terms of you know, the, the federal money as well as um, Medicaid money that can be applied for, and then also um, the monitoring and coming up with a new strategy going forward. The funding that is in the EMS training fund at the moment, again, um, the health department is open to other options, but it was the advisory committee's recommendation that we are basing this on. Um, that it really be best spent on training as that continues to be a big problem facing um, agencies across the state. That's a good question. Thank you. 
Drew, did you want to jump in with a uh, response on that? Are you going like this? <laughs> yeah, um, one of the, not necessarily um, on the longer term, uh, one of the short term um, discussions that we have had and we did request um, relief on the uh, provider tax that is due uh, from ambulance services um, on the 1st of June. And we received communication back that the um, ambulance services are still required to pay the provider tax, um, but that provider tax uh, penalties will not be enforced. Uh, the challenge for services is that under the Paycheck Protection Act, um, they cannot have outstanding tax. So uh, for example, our service, uh, we did receive the um, the paycheck protection, and now we're going to have to take 50, uh, just over 50,000 of that and send it back to the state in order to make sure that our tax liabilities are met so that we can um, keep our paycheck protection money in the short term. So if we could do anything to um, delay those as opposed to just waiving the penalties, then um, that would uh, make at least short term funding uh, for ambulance services a little bit easier. All right, thank you. Um, Mike Merwicki. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is a, a general question for you and for the committee. Uh, we're faced with a, a statewide problem here, I feel. And we're also faced with the concerns of the Senate that we're gonna have to balance what we're doing. And I wonder, since other committees, I think are doing this now, if at some point it would make sense for us to hold a, a joint committee hearing with our counterparts in the Senate on this topic. So we do have um, plans to do a joint committee meeting with them on a different topic. Um, and so depending on how that meeting gets scheduled, we might be able to find time to do both, um, both topics. Um, uh, so I will defer to, to Senator White to to let us know once she has scheduled a joint meeting um, what she can uh, what she thinks we can do in terms of um, broadening the the conversation. Um, you know this this topic goes beyond the purview of government operations and very solidly into the appropriations uh, committee. So we can make a recommendation. Um, but it is going to need to uh, be weighed by also by the um, the appropriations committee as well. So uh, we should continue to dig into this. And, and that's why I, I understand that and why I think it might be expeditious for House and Senate GovOps to to get on the same page so it can get over to to approps and the other any other committees uh, as soon as possible. It's a good, a good suggestion. Thank you. Um, Jim Harrison and then John Gannon. Yeah, thank you. Um, tomorrow, we're likely to pass uh, what I think it's what 182. And it includes a provision in there for some emergency borrowing from county funds for the sheriff departments. And this may be more of a question for Nolan, but to get through the crisis and then we can sort of sort things out going forward. Um, are there any funds that we could give authorization that ambulance services that are, you know, maybe didn't get the payroll protection program or have some other extenuating circumstances could borrow from to make sure that we don't all of a sudden lose some of these regional services. Um, for the record, Nolan Langwell, the Joint Fiscal Office. Um, prior to hearing what I just heard Drew say about some of the $377,000 already being spent, um, there were some conversations that were being had um, offline on the Senate side about um, asking EHS to use excess receipts from the fund to, to get some of that money out. Um, I've also heard that, but that was prior to hearing the conversation that 
the EMS advisory committee felt that that money should actually be used for training uh, and not towards helping them stay afloat. So the question becomes, are we talking about money to get money out immediately for training or are we talking about getting money out to keep them afloat? If we're talking about training, then the money is there in the fund to do just that. Um, in addition to that, keep in mind that there's 377,000 that was a carry forward. Um, the fund also generally gets $150,000 a year. Now, whether that money comes in or not in a post COVID world, it's unclear because that's money that's taxed or taken from insurance. It goes through this whole process, but essentially it comes from insurance companies. So in theory, that 150 is also on the table, but that also falls under the existing process that, that Dan can probably talk better to about how that money gets out. And then, and granted, there's been conversations, and I think Representative Cordes expressed some level of uh, frustration over the bureaucracy of it. But having talked with Shayla, some um, I, I understand the I understand what's going on there. The second part of that question becomes: if it's talking about trying to get money out immediately, um, part of the CARES Act gave Vermont one point two five billion dollars to help. Um, <laughs> Hold on, hush, sorry, my dog's barking. Um, $1.25 billion bucket of money that's gonna be used to help the state for various things. Um, there are some restrictions on that, but they have more to do with, can't be used to um, plant revenues or money that was already appropriated, et cetera, et cetera. That said, 1.25 billion sounds like a lot of money, but we have a lot of other pressing things as well um in terms of the education fund and other pieces that are also sort of vying for that dollars that said it doesn't sound like ems needs gazillions of dollars so one of the things or conversations that had been had in senate gov ops uh, i don't remember if that was in the letter or not betsy can answer this but was about um sending a letter or could it, how that money is going to be distributed is still a conversation that's happening at joint fiscal and others in terms of how the money gets prioritized for the various things. Is it appropriated? Can the administration just do it? Nonetheless, there are processes in place uh, and making it a priority for the appropriations folks saying that when we put money out, please make sure that EMS is a priority. It's priority to us. Please don't forget them and make some kind of recommendation. That's an avenue that can be done. Now, that's not an overnight answer, but that's something that can be done through the appropriations process. Um, just sort of this committee making it a, a, a priority uh, when you make your priority recommendations to the House Appropriations Committee. So those are my immediate suggestions that I can think of. Does that answer okay, the question? You. It's um, <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's as clear as uh, you know that stuff on the road when it's springtime and it rains. Gotcha. Uh, <laughs> clear as mud. Um, John Gannon. Yeah, I got my question answered. I mean, I mean, if we do have EMS services that are potentially going to be disrupted, um, I mean, we should try to use some of the CARES Act money to to make make sure that those um, stay in business. Absolutely, it's a good, a very good point. All right, um, let's open this up for any committee discussion, any um, uh, any further questions for the research you'd like to do. Um, all right, I am not seeing any little blue hands or any real hands raising. Okay, so that um, that finishes our um, uh, our exploration of the EMS funding issue for today. Um, so I want to thank uh, the folks for being with us. Thanks to the healthcare committee folks and uh, also the Department of Health folks. Um, Mike Merwicki has one more question. Madam Chair, it's a process question. And uh, as somebody who is a visual learner and a slow processor um, with verbal information, 
verbal sharing of information, we took in a lot today. So I'm, I'm wondering if um, we could set some time aside at our next meeting uh, to follow up for committee discussion on this. Yes, I certainly think we can do that. Um, we can make as much time as we need to review this. We do have another committee meeting scheduled for later this week, and we can spend some time in discussion if you want to reach out to your own um, local EMS agencies and get any on the ground updates from them. Um, please feel free to do that. Um, and also I just saw an email come through that we are tentatively scheduled to have a joint committee meeting with Senate Government Operations on Friday at one. That is not, um, it's not technically on EMS funding issues. It's, uh, it's actually intended to be an update on elections issues. But um, I will ask Jeanette if we can spend some time um, uh, having a conversation on Friday on this when we're done with elections. So, um, so stay tuned, we will come back to this topic. Any other questions for, uh, for any of the EMS related witnesses we have with us today? All right, I'm not seeing any hands. So it looks like we're good to go. So thank you to Drew and Shayla and Dan for being with us. Thank you, Representative Durfee for being with us and helping us understand the work that the House Health Care Committee has already done on this topic. Uh, we will continue working on this um, and uh, welcome any of you to follow up with us via email if you have any other thoughts or information you think we need. So thank you for uh, being with us today. We're going to shift gears to another topic now. So thank you. All right. Super. Oh, there's JP. Hi, JP. Excellent. Great. Um, okay, so we are, um, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you all just because I like the fun of that. Um, <laughs> we are going to have a bill to present on the floor tomorrow. So John Gannon is going to be doing that, um, that floor report. Do you feel like you have everything you need, John? Yes. I mean, I think um, everybody's current comfortable with the direction of S-182 today. I mean, I didn't hear anyone ask for an amendment to it or, or anything like that. So, um, and hopefully in all house caucus, I can answer any questions or concerns people have with the direction of the bill. Are you yeah, sure you I, can handle it? It could be a little more complicated than cannabis. <laughs> it could be, I mean, it has three topics, you know, it has, you know, EM, EMT, you know, plumbers and electricians and sheriffs. So yeah, it's a little more complicated. Mm -hmm. But no, I mean, people may have questions about it, but you know, I think, you know, what I can say about, you know, continuing funding for EMS is that uh, mm -hmm. we heard testimony today about some of the issues around that and we are gonna continue to follow it. Um, yeah. so, I understand we're having, a, we're having a caucus of the whole tomorrow, right? At 10.30? Yes. And you'll be touching upon this during then, and then we'll have a floor session later in the afternoon. I assume so. Yeah. Great. Well, I would imagine that um, other members of the body are hearing from their EMS services as well. So, um, so yeah, probably being a bit proactive in, in letting them know that we have heard this testimony and we're going to continue working on it um, would make sense. Yeah, um, Sarah, do we, um, going back to Mari's suggestion about the committee report, I assume she was talking about the DFR report on 182. Do we need to do a floor amendment on that? So Betsy no. Ann has an answer to that. Mm -hmm. 
Hi, uh, in regard to the DFR report back, it's to the committees of jurisdiction, which are in the bill, the GovOps committees and the healthcare committees, both House and Senate. So the okay. DFR report would go back to both House GovOps and House Healthcare. Okay, so they're already covered. Thank you. Correct. Great. All right, any other questions, committee members? All right, let me just get a couple of updates for you. Um, so we had talked last week and possibly two weeks ago. I don't know, the days all run together for me. I don't know if they do for you. Um, uh, we had talked about the issues around quasi-judicial proceedings and, um, and that some municipalities were, uh, were having trouble moving forward with um, certain kinds of proceedings because of the statutory requirement that there be a, an in-person or on-site uh, inspection or, um, or meeting location. So um, I think given that the Senate did not, um, did not send us that language with the bill that they're sending over to us now, I think I'm gonna suggest that we move forward with creating a committee bill that we can um, work on at our next committee meeting and then be prepared to, uh, to vote out. So if you, um, if you need to review that language, it should be on our committee page um, under Tucker Anderson, because I believe that he did that uh, drafting for us. So if you wanna review that, we will come back to that later this week with the intention of moving that out. Um, and if there are other uh, COVID emergency provisions that you are hearing about that you think we ought to consider along with that, um, this is a good time to, to talk with Legislative Council about getting something drafted to put before the committee. And also, please feel free to give me a heads up so I know it's coming. <laughs> um, so any thoughts? Questions, ideas, suggestions, concerns? I'm not seeing anybody jumping. All right, good deal. All right, so I will see you all on the giant all house um, caucus tomorrow to review bills. And then we'll be of course on the floor session. And I just wanna say, Congratulations to you today because I didn't put your hands down for you today because that's not the way we do it when we're, we're following floor protocols and you guys picked it up immediately. I, I just have to say though also that watching the floor session last week, um, uh, I, I felt a great sense of pride at the, um, the fact that there were no technical difficulties among the members of the Government Operations <laughs> Committee in executing our floor session last week. Not that it's a contest, but I was <laughs> noting that some other committees, chairs had some people who were having trouble. <laughs> Wasn't a contest, but we won. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we had some, I, we had more practice than some of those other committees. And there are a few technically challenged folks among our house. And we had less practice than some of the people who had some significant yeah. problems. Some, um, were, some were verbally challenged as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I, no I thought that was just exercising, you know, some <laughs> rather colorful um, vocabulary. Um, Mike Rewicki and Marsha Gardner have their hands up. Go ahead, Mike. No, I, I want to also congratulate our committee because none of us dropped an F bomb. <laughs> <laughs> Just remember, we're still on live stream, so it's out there for everyone to watch. <laughs> not over, it's not there. over yet. Uh, Marsha. So thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just want to ask if we will be taking up S-344 at our next meeting. 
So we do need to start talking about that. We've looked a little bit at, at the language <clears throat> that is in that bill. Um, <clears throat> the Ways and Means Committee is also going to want to have a look at it because um, it does reference the state education tax as well as municipal taxes, and there may be some concerns around the impact to uh, state revenues by allowing municipalities the freedom that is uh, that I believe is granted in the current version of that bill. So, um, so yes, we will take that up again at our next meeting. Thank you. Anybody else have a question? Excellent. All right. Well, that was a, a fairly efficient um, meeting today. I appreciate everybody's attention. Uh, we've got a lot of floor time sprinkled into our um, the rest of our week. So we'll um, we will see each other in the massive scrolling through of 150 something members uh, starting tomorrow. So. If there aren't any other questions or announcements, I think we'll go ahead and sign off. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Great. All right. See you later.